Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. If you uh, if you like this podcast, uh, you can consider becoming a Patreon supporter. But uh, a really good way to support me and support what we're doing here is to leave me an Apple podcast review. So please stop what you're doing. Go do that. Leave me a five-star review, an honest five-star review. Uh, and give me a comment. That would be huge. It would really help with all the algorithm crap that's going on. Uh, that would be awesome. Please go do that. But uh, yeah, enough about that. I'm really excited about today's uh, episode because we're going to be talking about Pascal's Wager. And for any of you who know, uh, I mean, my my podcast is called Parker's Ponces, Pensies, whatever. I'm an American swine. Um, but this was something I was kind of embarrassed about in Pascal, his his wager. I always kind of skipped that part of the Pensies. But uh I'm excited because my mind's been changed and because of the work of this uh, scholar who I have on today. So today I'm, I'm interviewing Dr. Liz Jackson. And uh, instead of uh, stumbling through her stats, we're just going to talk about it uh, with her. So without further ado, Liz, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here today. Yeah, well, um, so I'm I'm like chomping at the bit, but I want to give the audience a little bit uh, of who you are in case they're not aware. I mean, you've been popping up all over the place lately, uh, doing all these <laughs> interviews, doing great. But uh, how did you get into uh, philosophy? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm kind of like, where do I begin? Do I begin <laughs> with me as a five-year-old, like asking my parents, <laughs> like I was like the annoying why kid times like a hundred, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So I think I was always interested in philosophy from a pretty young age, but mm -hmm. I just didn't know that was what it was. Like I didn't know it was called philosophy. And I remember as probably a, what I've been like 19 or 20 year old trying to figure out what I wanted to major in in college. And I was like, well, maybe I thought about political science. I actually was like a math major for a couple months. Okay. I was kind of, I was kind of going around and trying to figure it out. And then I was like, maybe I should try a philosophy class. So I took a philosophy class, and it was actually it was moral and political philosophy, which mm. isn't my area of specialization, or you know, it's something I'm interested in, but it's sure. not like you know my thing. But like even that class, I was just like, I found, I found my people. Like yeah. I found like, like just the way that they thought about things and the fact that they were basically willing to question like any assumption and mm -hmm. just like the the rigorous and logical way they thought through things. I just, I loved all of it and I, I ate it up. So, yeah. um, so I became a philosophy major. And then at some point I was actually sort of torn between going to seminary and then going to like grad school in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, like when I was kind of making the decision, I was looking into it a little bit and I was like, oh, seminary is super expensive. And if I can get into a grad school in philosophy, it's actually, they're almost all fully funded. Yeah. And in fact, you even get a stipend. Right. And so I was like, it's like, I think I'm going to try grad school in philosophy first. I mean, that wasn't the only reason, but you know, that was one of the big reasons. I also, mm -hmm. I wanted um, like an analytic school, like a school that really valued like clarity and logic and rigor. And so I think mm -hmm. I was convinced that doing philosophy would be more of that than maybe some seminaries at least. Um, so those were the two main reasons. And then, um, yeah, it was, it was great. I ended up getting into Notre Dame, which was kind of my dream school, which was super, super exciting. I even yeah. remember when I first got the email, sorry, I'm like being really long winded right now, but it's good. This is all good. <laughs> yeah. I love it. When I first got the email, I thought it was fake. I was like, someone's pranking me. I didn't get into Notre Dame. <laughs> um, and wow. then I found out I really did get in and it was, it was really exciting. So I did my PhD at Notre Dame in philosophy. And then um, I did one year of research actually in Australia, which was super fun. Yeah. And then now I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Ryerson University, which is a school in Toronto, Canada. So that's yeah. awesome. Well, did, I think I saw I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this. I thought um, I thought I may have seen you're going to be helping out uh, teaching a course uh, down at PBA with with Paul Gould. Is, or is that is that on? Is that happening? Yeah, yeah. So that's a more recent thing, but they are starting a master's in philosophy of religion program. Yeah. And they basically just have four of us. They have um, Paul and Paul. So Paul Gould yeah. and Paul uh, Copen are mm -hmm. the are the two full time faculty. And then there's four of us that are actually going to be teaching a, one class like roughly every two years. I think it's kind of flexible. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing a class like during one of the breaks at Ryerson. I'll be doing a class there uh, once every two years. So I think I'm actually not even doing my first one till like 
it's either like 2022 or 2023, I forget. But um, but I'm super yeah. excited. And I think I might actually do a class on Pascal's Wager. I haven't fully nice. decided, but I, I think it would be really fun to, and it'll be like a grad class and a lot of people that are really interested in kind of philosophy of religion. So I think it would be really fun to, to yeah. do that as a topic. That sounds, so. that sounds so great. Well, and I think I think JP uh, Moreland is going to be doing that as well. Uh, mm-hmm. So any of the listeners, I, I didn't know this was going to turn into an ad for PBA, but uh, <laughs> it is. So to check it out. It'd be awesome. Yeah, uh, I wasn't expecting definitely. that, but, but Paul Gould will be excited <laughs> that I did that for him. So, uh, so, so philosophy, actually, uh, your story, my, my story is, is a little bit similar. Uh, and I, mm-hmm. I found out about terminal uh, MA degrees and philosophy and stuff like that. But uh, it turns out when I, I was engaged to my now wife, uh, and we found out that I could go to Ted's for free because she's been working here. So I had, that's mm-hmm. kind of like the dowry that I got from her. So <laughs> uh, I, went, I went the theology route and then Lord willing, I'll, I'll be going into philosophy uh, after this. Did you, awesome. did you go right to Notre Dame then, or did, did you go right to PhD or did you do a master's there too? I, well, I did a master's like on the way. So okay. um, it's some programs. It's interesting. So actually theology is totally different than this. In theology, you can't even get accepted into a PhD program without having a master's degree. Right. It's like, they won't even consider your application is my understanding. <laughs> yeah. Which yep. is, yeah, it's, it's really different. So in philosophy, um, a lot of programs, for some reason, they'll just accept you straight out of undergrad. So you just yeah. need a bachelor's degree. And I think, I mean, that's that's another another discussion, I think, right. whether that's a good idea to do that or not. But I do, I do think there are some benefits of doing a master's degree. I think it looks <laughs> a lot different to jobs if you do like, you know, a two-year master's degree and then five to six years of PhD versus yeah. doing, you know, like eight, nine, ten years of PhD that, you know, the master's degree just gives you time to develop and yeah. sort of collect your thoughts. And another thing too, is if you want to be a professor, the job market is so competitive. So if you do a master's degree, I think it just gives you more time to get some publications and just kind of make yourself more competitive. So there are pros and cons with it. And I didn't even know, I didn't know what I was (laughs) doing when I was applying. So I didn't know about a lot of this, but um, I was, it was nice in my case that I was able to do it a little quicker. So I basically, my first two years at Notre Dame, um, I basically just got a master's degree. You do a certain number of classes or something. And then uh was able to just continue on in the same program and then do my phd at the end so it it was nice that it saved me time so yeah definitely that's huge well so you you mentioned uh that you you thought about going to seminary so uh i know this could be talked but but that means you grew up in a a christian home probably you some somewhere Mm -hmm. along the line and uh i you you said that your your parents were involved with crew is that right can we Mm -hmm. we talk about that you allowed to talk about that yeah, for sure. I'm happy to talk about it. So yeah. um, my parents were crew crew staff before from before I was born. Um, so <laughs> I was born into a crew family. Yeah. It's actually hilarious. Like, I remember I was like, I don't know how old I was, probably like in elementary or middle school being like, oh, not everyone's parents like raise support. Yeah. Like it was just this thing because it, it's all I had ever known was yeah. um, was was the crew life. And um my parents were actually, they they worked in Kansas and then they worked in Atlanta, Georgia, but actually did a lot of work in Budapest, Hungary as well. So oh, something that not as many people know about me is I actually lived in Budapest for seven years. Wow. So um, so it was kind of kind of a fun experience. Um, got to travel a lot and see a lot of things. And, and yeah, my parents actually are not with crew anymore. Mm-hmm. They're now with a different organization, but they were with crew for like, I want to say at least 20 years, maybe wow. longer. And um, I actually did, I did like a one year internship with crew in between undergrad and grad school. So yeah. I've done some crew stuff too. So it's fun. Cause you're, are you currently on staff? Yeah. I'm or, on staff with, with yeah. athletes in action. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. I did some AIA stuff. I, I played basketball and, you know, um, liked, like sports. So I I've done some AIA stuff and, and knew a lot of AIA staff, um, yeah. especially when I was in college in Kansas. So did you, did yeah. you play, uh, in undergrad? I d- yeah, so it's kind of um, <laughs> it's kind of a unique situation, but I actually played at like a smaller school called Manhattan Christian College, okay. and um, I played basketball there, and then um, went to Kansas State, and that's kind of where I got my philosophy degree. So I normally just say that I went to Kansas State when people ask, yeah. but I actually did did go to Manhattan Christian College as well and um, play basketball there. So it was really fun, and Dang. I still try to play as much as I can. Um, at Notre Dame, we would like me and a few other friends that all played basketball. We would play like every single basketball intramural mm. possible. So yeah. um, I, I got to play a good amount in grad school. It's been really sad with COVID. It's been so much harder to, to play, yeah. especially because with basketball, you kind of need 
you know, at least six people and preferably 10 to really have a, a real game going. And, right. you know, it's just, it's hard to find that with COVID. So, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. That, that's so awesome. It's so great to, to hear uh, that, that, uh, so we, we got JP Moreland and we have uh, William Lynn Craig, two, two folks that came out of crew and, and Liz is the next one, the, the, <laughs> the next generation of, uh, of Christian leaders to come out of there. It's awesome. Um, so Liz, then you, you go to Notre Dame and I think you worked on ep epistemology, right? Mm -hmm. did, yeah. Did, epistemology. Did, you, yeah. did you do your uh, dissertation on the wager or was it just related or what? Well, yeah. What did you do your dissertation on? Yeah. So my dissertation wasn't on the wager at all, okay. actually. Um, okay. My dissertation was on, so the relationship between belief and confidence or what, a, like what philosophers often call credence. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might believe it's going to rain tomorrow, but you might have like a 0.9 level of confidence. So it's like not, you're like 90% sure it's going to rain tomorrow. And yeah. sort of what's the relationship between those two attitudes. And that's actually, it's not unrelated to Pascal's wager, but it was definitely, uh, you know, more of just kind of an epistemology dissertation and bringing together these two kinds of attitudes, thinking about how they fit together and how they relate to other debates in epistemology. So that was okay. my dissertation topic. So is, is there, did you just spend a ton of time working on like Bayesian probability theory and stuff like that or? Somewhat. Yeah, definitely okay. is one of my interests was kind of the Bayesian stuff. We had like a reading group where we we read some of that and then some about like just the people that were writing about the relationship between belief and credence. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always been, you know, it was kind of funny in undergrad at Kansas State when where I studied philosophy, uh, the people that were very, very formal, very, very Bayesian, decision mm -hmm. theory, all that kind of stuff. And then at Notre yeah. Dame, there wasn't a lot of that formal stuff. People were more into traditional epistemology. And that's actually mm. kind of what got me interested in my dissertation topic, because I was like, well, these people say they're doing epistemology and these people say they're doing epistemology, but it looks very different because these yeah. people are just talking about belief and these people are modeling it all as like probabilities. So how does that like fit together? So that's yeah. actually what kind of got me interested in it. Um, but the wager stuff, I would say, traces all the way back to undergrad as well, because me and some friends, we were always really interested in philosophy of religion. And so then because we were brought up in the, like brought up, I'm saying it as if they were our parents, but you know, our, <laughs> right. our, the philosophy community at Kansas state was very formal, was very decision theory ish. Um, I think it was natural that we all kind of got interested in Pascal's wager. Like, could we, does decision theory give us some kind of reason to believe in God? Like, could that even make sense? And one of my friends, um, Andy Rogers, who isn't in philosophy anymore, he's doing psychology stuff, but he was actually one of the people that got me really interested in Pascal's Wager. And one of the papers I wrote, we co-authored together. So it's mm. the one that's called Salvaging Pascal's Wager. Right. So um, so he was, I mean, I really should give him a lot of credit. Like he was really one of the big people that that got me into into the wager and got me interested in it. So yeah, well, that's awesome. So, so for me, I, I love like, I love self-defeating arguments, self-refutation, self-defeat. I love the, like the kind of stuff that it, it seems a little bit more like certainty and it's really tricky. I love transcendental arguments and stuff. And then, mm. uh, I, I met my friend Nate Lawfer and he is all about probabilities for everything. He just wants <laughs> everything to be in Bayesian reasoning. And I've avoided all that because it's so like math. Uh, yeah. but then it, it's so cool when I want to listen to your conversations and it's, it's sweet that you're kind of at the nexus and you're trying to look at both. Uh, and it, it's really interesting because you, you bring up the wager. And like I said earlier, I, I really did not like this part of Pascal. I liked everything <laughs> else. I liked his theology. He's a Jansenist, uh, which is like, I would say they're closet Calvinist. That was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the Pensies are, are awesome. I, I named my podcast, the Pensies because, uh, Pascal didn't finish his work. And so we, we got the, the hard task of trying to figure out what, what he meant by some stuff, where it should go where. And so I thought, if I wait until I got a PhD, I'll never say anything or I could die and all my thoughts will be scattered. So let's get it out here, even if it's not uh, that good. So Pascal has been really influential for me, except for the wager part. And then here you come along and you're re-motivating this for, for me. And so uh, I wanted to pass that on to all my listeners. Um, so what is uh, Pascal's wager? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So, and it's funny. So the way I often start off with Pascal's wager is I really give this really simple version. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, I do that so people can understand it. But I will. Yeah. I want to say this first. It's kind of misleading, just mm -hmm. because arguably it's not even the version that Pascal himself gave. So yeah. I'll give a really simple version, but then maybe we can talk a little bit about 
Um, the more nuanced versions that are out there, like Pascal's himself, and then I think I have a different version, and then there's other philosophers that also have different versions. So yeah. the most kind of basic version of the wager is this. And, and I'll say this too, when you look at the arguments for God's existence, like the ontological argument and the cosmological argument, those arguments conclude that God exists. So mm -hmm. they're making a claim about the world. They're giving evidence that God exists. So what's different about Pascal's wager is that the claim isn't God exists. The claim is that you should believe in God. So yeah. it's not a claim about the world in the same way. And it's not giving evidence that God exists. It's saying kind of given the risk reward trade off. Um, it's better to believe in God. It's in your best interest to believe in God. Yeah. And so the thought is this, well, look, if you believe in God and God exists, you have a lot to gain, potentially an infinite um, good to gain if you go to heaven. Um, and if you don't believe in God and God exists, um, there's debates about what would happen there. You might be annihilated. You might go to hell. Mm -hmm. um, if you're annihilated, it's, I guess, zero. If you go to hell, it's negative infinity. But yeah. things don't look don't look so good if you um, don't believe in God and God exists. Mm -hmm. If God doesn't exist, then whether you believe in God or not, we can debate about, you know, well, one bad thing about believing in God, if God doesn't exist, is you would have a false belief, you know, mm -hmm. then there's debates about whether it's good to believe in God anyway, even if God doesn't exist. Right. Um, so, you know, we can debate about if God doesn't exist, you know, how it would, whether it would be good to believe in God or not believe in God. But the point is that those trade th those payoffs would be finite yeah. um it would, be, it would be a finite gain or a finite loss either way and so then the thought is well look believing in god just kind of given this setup just seems a lot better than not believing in god kind of get, given these trade-offs you have a lot to gain and if you believe in god and god exists and you have a lot to lose if you don't believe in god and god exists and then if god doesn't exist it's really finite either way so yeah. that's and a that, basic that, argument that four you, you couch it in like four, uh, four matrices, right. Or a matrix mm -hmm. of four uh, squares there. And I, I think it's really, it, uh, you're really helpful in the way you describe it. Cause you're not saying there's nothing to lose. You're saying there's a finite number and that yeah. finite number might be kind of large. Cause you could say, well, I could party, I could do this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, mm -hmm. and you could maybe uh, make a large list, but it's still a finite list because on the other side is mm -hmm. infinity. Exactly. So, yeah. so I think one misconception is that you say there's nothing to lose if you believe in God and God doesn't exist. And that's, that wouldn't be the claim, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting to think about is just there is some empirical research about benefits of believing in God and it is correlated right. arguably with happiness, being less likely to be divorced with being, you know, all these, all these good things. And so, you know, that, that research is tentative obviously, and I don't yeah. want to put too much weight on it, but it's interesting to think about um, how that might weigh against, you know, you can't party or or whatever. Right. And I think you can yeah. party, you know, I mean, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. just to Christian partying, you know, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, I've, I've heard it in, in some political uh, philosophy as well. Um, like the, the golden triangle of freedom. And so even if you, even if God didn't exist, but you believe in th that he exists, it's, It'll, it'll make for a more virtuous populace, which is easier to rule. And so you get more freedom because you don't have to have as many laws. And that kind of goes along with what you're saying, that it's a an argument for belief in God. And in, in, uh, in the transcendental argument uh, kind of language, we, we've, because uh, of Barry Stroud, we've had to be, uh, it's been bifurcated into world-directed arguments and then conceptual arguments. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think what, what this one's more a conceptual argument about belief. Uh, and so it's not going at like the, the veracity of God's existence, but it's about whether you ought to believe or not. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, so is there, is there an ethics to, to like epistemology? I, I ask this question, people usually chafe. So, so I hope it doesn't, it doesn't bother you too bad, but it seems like it's kind of the ought there's, there's, is it just prudent? Is it just uh, like a pragmatic argument that maybe you should, or you shouldn't, or is there like an ethical uh, component here? It's a great question. Um, different versions of the wager are different. I think okay. the most traditional version is focuses on the pragmatic, okay. but I totally think you can have a moral version of the wager and I see no, re like I see no reason to rule that out. And in fact, Mike Rhoda, one of the people who defends a contemporary version of the wager, whose book it's called Taking Pascal's Wager. And mm -hmm. I, I recommend that to, to your audience, but um, he, he explicitly talks about a moral version of the wager. Mm -hmm. And you could think, I mean, there's a, a, a number of different ways it could go, but you could think like if God existed and I, you know, believed in God or committed to God or followed God, 
that would be a morally good thing. It seems like, you know, yeah. like obeying, obeying God's commands or pursuing God um, seem, seems like it could be a morally good thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you might also think wagering could, um, you know, have like bring, bring about certain good things for like my close friends and family. Um, mm -hmm. And that might, you know, either make, make them more likely to go to heaven or it might just be good for them in various ways. And so it doesn't have to just be this thing that's all about you and, and your eternal destiny. I think you could think about God's preferences or the preferences of those around you. And uh, Mike Rota spells this all out in, in more detail, but I, I'm totally open to, to including that in the wager. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. I'll have to check yeah. that out. I've, I've heard a lot about that book, but I, I haven't read it myself. Um, so you, in, in one of the papers that you sent me, um, you talk about taking Pascal's wager and that, that would be making a commitment to God, largely motivated by non-epistemic reasons. And mm -hmm. uh, I know, so there's, there's a whole debate and this happens with just about every argument where it's like the founder had this argument and then people take that and it turns into something different. And you already alluded to this where you outright said it. So Pascal's version is going to be different and there's different versions. And it seems like every argument is a family of arguments, right? Yeah. So even for like Vantillians, we say tag, but it's, it's a whole family or you, the cosmological argument is a whole family, right? And so this is a family. I wanted to read just a, a tiny bit of Pascal um, because I was like, oh, I don't know about that. But I, I look back <laughs> and uh, Pascal says, um, let us then examine this point and say, and let us say either God is or he is not. But to which shall we be inclined? Reason cannot de decide this question. Infinite chaos separates us. At the far end of this infinite distance, a coin is being spun, which will come down heads or tails. How will you wager? Reason cannot make you choose either. Reason cannot prove either wrong. And so then he goes on and says, but you must wager. There is no choice. You, already, you are already committed. Which will you choose? Well, let us see. And so he goes on and talks about how everyone must make this wager, but that... Uh, you know, on one side you have you have everything to gain, or you have infinity infinity to gain, and the other, you, you don't have much to lose here. And so, that is like it it did set up this wager, but there's this whole historical debate. And was he talking to Christians? Because everyone was a, a Christian at that time. They were debating on whether they're Jansenists or uh, you know reformers or whatever. And so there's this whole thing where people will go, well, that's actually not Pascal's wager because that should be used for Christians, not for atheists. It wasn't historically. But I just wanted to address that it's come downstream, and now you're saying it, it actually is a theistic argument, but it's not for God's existence for belief. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that, like, preempt that that argument that this is meant for Christians kind of thing. It's it's we're downstream. We can still talk about it as a as an argument. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts actually, but um, yeah. one thought is I. I also don't even think that my version or Mike Rhoda's version or whatever has to just be for atheists either. And yeah. in fact, in my personal like like relationship with God, I've actually uh, been really, it's just doing this work has actually, I think, really encouraged me mm. uh, when like, I, I don't think I've ever been to the point where I would say I'm an agnostic or I'm not a Christian, but I still gone through places where I doubted a lot. And I was right. like, is this true? Like, how do I deal with like the problem of evil and like really horrible stuff that Christians do. And, you know, I mean, I've struggled with this and I think thinking in a Pascalian way has helped me. And so I actually think Pascal's wager can be something that's for atheists and agnostics, but I think it can also totally be something that's for Christians and kind of can help help them continue in their commitment to God and um, continue to pursue God, even in light of serious doubts. So I see yeah. it as a both and there. Yeah, that's, that's so helpful. Uh, so, uh, uh, there's a like a five dollar word that I use a lot because I, I learned it in class and I really like it, um, and it comes up uh, occasionally. But it's doc doxastic volunteerism, and I was wondering how this. Uh, so that's the view that you can like voluntarily believe things, and so some people will say, well, no, you you can't do that, and that's not how we work. Where you know if someone convinces us through reason, you are determined to believe that because of reason. It's not you don't choose. And then there's there's kind of some psychology in there. I'm sure there's a psychological debate and an epistemic debate and all sorts of stuff. Do, does um, does using Pascal's wager commit you to a type of doc doxastic volunteerism? Like why or why not? I'm sure you've thought through that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the answer is no. Um, Pascal's wager doesn't commit you to doxastic volunteerism. And this relates to something you mentioned earlier where there's just different versions or, or types yeah. of the wager. And so one distinction I will often make is uh, you could wager in a beliefy way. So you could do like 
you could call it a doxax, doxastic wager. Mm -hmm. So you wager and say, I'm going to believe in God because of the benefits I could get from that. And, you know, because of this risk reward trade-off. Um, but there's also in my Rhoda's version of the wager is this, um, there's like a, what you might call a commitment wager or what philosophers will call an acceptance wager. Mm. So when you accept, accept something, you act as if it's true. Um, and you could also think, you know, if you're committing to God, that doesn't necessarily mean you believe in God. You're just, maybe you're going to uh, practice the religion. You're going to go to church. You're going to read the Bible. You're going to do the, th the things that you think God wants you to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that has to involve belief. So I think, I think the first the first thing to say is no, if you want to go in for this commitment version of the wager, you don't have to accept doxastic voluntarism at all because you're not even making it about belief. You're, the wager is um, causing you to commit to God and, and maybe yeah. you'll come to believe in God eventually, but that's not, that's not even what you're, that's not what you're focused on, I guess yeah. I'll say. Maybe that could be a goal, I guess, but that's not what you're focused on. Um, so that's one thing to say. Yeah. Um, but the other thing to say is, um, I don't know. I, I like to be controversial and defend controversial theses. So so in my version of the wager, I actually like the idea of at least having an option for the wager, making it still about belief. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I point out, I think in, in one of the papers that I sent to you, is that you know, a lot of people that say we, we don't have control of our beliefs or we can't choose choose our beliefs, yeah. they focus on these cases of beliefs that are really obviously true or really obviously false. So yeah. I can't make myself believe that one plus one equals three. Mm -hmm. um, I can't make myself disbelieve that the world is round, you know, like yeah. those are things that I'm just way too committed to. I have way too much evidence. But I think the more interesting cases are cases where you're really torn yeah. between two options and you're really like, uh, you you could really see it going either way. And Peter Van Inwagen in his autobiography has this really, really cool quote where he basically describes his conversion in this way. And he says, I could see the world as created, but then I could step back and see it as uncreated. And I could almost move back and forth at will hmm. similar to, um, so I don't know if you've seen like the duck rabbit yeah, picture yeah. where you can see it as a duck and see it as a rabbit. Yeah. So I want to get a yeah. tattoo actually of, of the duck rabbit. Yeah. Oh, I love Red it. Rabbit. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. So he, he described his conversion experience in those, in those terms, which I thought was so interesting. And mm. he, I think he even literally said I could move back and forth at will seeing the world as created and seeing the world as uncreated. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm not saying that most of us are in this position with respect to most things that we believe, but I do think we get, in places where we are really torn. We're like, like we're thinking about some some fact and thinking about two, like the world, and then think about two ways that we, that we could explain that. And we really go back and forth. And in that case, I'm a lot less convinced that we don't have some kind of control or, or the will can be involved in yeah. that kind of decision about what to believe. So. That's such a great point. Yeah, because yeah, there's exactly what you said. They'll bring up two plus two equals four or uh, try to try to believe in a square circle or something like that. It's like, okay, well, yeah, obviously not. But yeah, once you get more towards the periphery or or more towards like a, a, a worldview analysis or an inference to the best explanation or something that's more complex mm -hmm. than those simple things that we hold to be more certain about. Yeah, that's a really good point. But I, does that bring us to, um, so in one of your papers, you, you explain something called epistemic uh, permissivism. And is that what's at play right here? Is that where, because it's, I think you used that and said people will use this epistem epistemic permissivism to argue against the wager. Is that, is that right? Or am I getting mm. that wrong? So, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's, you're in the ballpark for sure. Okay, so, okay. so the idea of what I'm arguing in this one paper, it's actually, I mean, it's very related to the point we were just talking right. about. So mm -hmm. epistemic permissivism, it's this view that <laughs> given, given your evidence, um, you could be rational in holding different beliefs, or you could do it in terms of credences too, but let's just stick to beliefs. You could be rational in holding different beliefs uh, given your evidence. So you could think about a really basic example, like uh, there's two jurors and uh, they both have all the same evidence about whether someone committed the crime. They've been presented with all the same data. They're equally familiar with it. They've thought about it the same amount. Mm -hmm. And it seems like potentially they could disagree on whether that person's guilty, but neither of them is irrational. Yeah. Um, and it even seems like one of them could change their mind and say, actually, no, I think he's innocent. 
Um, but that doesn't, you know, it doesn't automatically mean he's irrational because sometimes evidence is really hard to evaluate. Sometimes yeah. there's good arguments on both sides. And so the thought behind epistemic permissivism is that the, the evidence doesn't always give us an obligation to, you know, believe something or disbelieve it. Sometimes, yeah. and, and even in the way that Peter Van Inwagen was describing, sometimes the evidence kind of leaves it open and we can yeah. kind of go back and forth. And sometimes I think some of us have evidence for God's existence that is like this, where mm -hmm. there's really, there is some really interesting arguments for God's existence, but like there's always, these, there's also these really interesting arguments that are really hard, like the problem of evil. And, you know, how do we balance these two? It doesn't seem like, at least in all cases, it's going to be automatically irrational if you take one, one stance or the other. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe some people like, there's religious mystics that have these experiences of God that are just undeniable. You know, it's just like <laughs> God has been so clear to them that maybe they're not in an epistemic permissive case. Mm -hmm. But I do think at least sometimes some of us are and and really our evidence, it could, it could be rational to to believe either thing. Yeah. I, so in my head, I have Richard Feldman just freaking out, being like, no, no, we have to withhold belief then, yeah. uh, which is funny. Yeah. And that's I love the, that you know that. That's awesome. <laughs> like, oh, <sorry>. yeah. <laughs> I know a little bit about disagreement literature. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> which it's it's super fun. But yeah, that, that one messed with me a lot because because he would say, no, you're not you're not reasonable then because you both shared your evidence. And it, it would depend, I guess, for him, if you're epistemic peers. And I guess a part of me is like, well, then maybe we're just not epistemic peers. I don't know. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so so epistemic permissivism is saying you can have evidence uh, on for or against this belief uh, and you can both be rational, even though you're at, at, at odds on this point. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah. OK, OK. And how does yeah. that how does that relate to uh, to the wager then? Yeah, so I think it, it can really bolster this this point I was making about doxastic voluntarism. Yeah. Where if if you're in a case, I mean, think about like the cases that are often used in the voluntarism literature. So mm -hmm. one plus one equals two. It's like that is not going to be a permissive case. Like mm -hmm. that's going to be a case where you should believe that. And if you don't believe one plus one equals two, you're you're probably irrational. I'm sorry, yeah. but like no, it's just not a permissive case, you know. Yeah. Um, but when you think about, I mean, you can think about a lot of different questions, like something you're really torn about. Or you think about really hard questions about the nature of reality that we talk about in philosophy, or you think about God's existence. It's not as clear that there's this one attitude that you just have to take yeah. because there is so much evidence on both sides and there is so much disagreement. And um, one thing about Feldman's point too, you know, so Feldman would say, well, if you're in that situation where there's a lot of evidence on both sides, you should just withhold belief. Mm -hmm. So you can, and, and maybe I'll say really quick, just for people's background, for every statement or proposition, you can believe it. So if you say it's true, you can disbelieve it, which says it's false, but you can also withhold belief. And you're mm -hmm. not really taking a stance either way when you do that. So like, I withhold belief that there's an even number of hairs on my head, you know, for example, yeah. right? So, yeah. so Feldman would say, in these cases, you should just withhold belief. Mm -hmm. But then what I think is really interesting, I mean, first of all, I just don't see why you have to withhold belief. Like if you have a lot of evidence for for this thing, it doesn't seem like it's irrational to believe it, especially yeah. if we don't think your your evidence has to be perfect to believe mm. it. But the other thing that I think is worth thinking about too is cases where your evidence is almost balanced in between withholding belief and believing. So mm. it's not balanced between disbelief and belief, it's balanced in between withholding belief and believing. Yeah. So, um, like, I don't know, I don't know how much I want to go into this, but there are cases where you're withholding belief on something and then evidence kind of slowly trickles in. And then by the end of the this case, it's you should believe. But mm -hmm. as the evidence is slowly trickling in, it seems like there's going to be some point in the middle there where you really could be rational to withhold belief or you really could be rational to believe. So you could think yeah. about a case where there's a sign that's really far away and you're slowly lock, walking towards it. And then by the end of the walk, you can see it very clearly. By the beginning of the walk, you can't see it at all. Yeah. It seems like there's some point where you could withhold belief that you know like it's a stop sign or you could believe and either one would be rational because your evidence is sort of slowly trickling in. So yeah. that's something to say to Feldman. I don't know. That's so good. That's, that's really interesting. <laughs> I, I think of like a Sorites paradox there now too. So it's like, is yeah. there one exact point, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. and no, I, I don't. Yeah, but that's, that's really interesting. This, it all reminds me of, I've been going back and forth on uh, the doctrine of divine simplicity and every mm. other guest that I have on disagrees and everyone's so smart and everyone tells me how much is at stake. And so I'm in that spot where I'm like, I just want to withhold belief. Can I just do that? 
And they're like, no, <laughs> yep. you must not. So this is helping me uh, for for my next guest, whoever it is who's going to argue one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> well, well. I'll just throw my my hat in yeah. there. I, I'm not a fan of divine simplicity because okay. I don't know how it can make sense of the Trinity. So there's my flat-footed objection. This is not my area of research, yeah. but <laughs> that's so but good. Yeah, it's it's a tricky issue, though. I mean, I, I see like I do see both sides of it, but I think I definitely fall on the the yeah. the no no simplicity side. <laughs> it's it's so tricky, and and then so you know, Dr. Tom McCall will will come on and say, well, it's because of simplicity that we can believe in the Trinity, and and yeah, so. <laughs> Um, but but moving moving on here. So yeah. <laughs> uh, something else that I found really helpful in in one of your papers, which I don't I don't want to say too much because I think it's it's either under review or still being worked on. So I won't name too much or anything. But that's um, fine. <laughs> you, you give this definition of faith that's really helpful, uh, mm. and you, you talk about uh, cognitive and connotative attitudes, and I found that really helpful. Not enough probably to uh, to describe it. Can you just describe that to us and, and the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So this this paper is one where I'm actually bringing together. So I kind of, I like research, like do some research on faith, do some research on Pascal's wager. So mm -hmm. this paper is kind of bringing those two together. And what I'm arguing in the paper is that a way of taking Pascal's wager can actually be, can actually demonstrate genuine faith. Yeah. Um, and this helps with the worry that like, you just have bad motives if you take Pascal's wager or God wouldn't be pleased if you take Pascal's wager. So I'm kind of trying to dispel that objection. But, but the way I kind of go about showing how actually taking Pascal's wager and having faith are kind of similar is, mm -hmm. is from this distinction. So, so cognitive attitudes, um, they have what's called a mind to world direction of fit. So mm -hmm. what that, what that means, let's just use belief, for example. Okay. So when I believe it's raining outside, that has a mind to world direction of fit in the sense that my mind conforms to, or at least should, you know, it should conform to the world. Mm -hmm. So the world is kind of what's determining uh, what I do and don't believe, at least yeah. if I'm rational, right? Um, other cognitive attitudes would be, you know, believing it would probably rain tomorrow, uh, having, like I was talking about credences or confidence levels, being very confident that it would rain tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And all these attitudes are ones where, the world should determine what we believe, at least in most cases. Um, so in that sense, there have a, there's a mind to world direction of fit. So those are cognitive attitudes. And so, so uh, then, yeah. does that, uh, does that smuggle in like a correspondence theory of truth? And does that matter? Cause one of my, one of my other philosophy friends was like, bro, everyone believes in the correspondence theory of truth. Don't even worry about anything else. Yeah. yeah that is kind of my attitude okay. as well. Okay. I hate to, I hate to, I mean, I, I so it's funny. I, I try not to be that teacher that just indoctrinates students. That's not what I want right. to do. But students love saying things like true for me, true for you, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. yeah. So I actually just taught my students the correspondence theory this year. I was just like, this is what's true when it corresponds yeah. to the world. And of course, I mean, it's controversial among philosophers. Um, some people like the coherence theory or other views, but mm -hmm. I do think it's definitely one of those cases where this is really kind of the dominant view, at least yeah. among a certain style of analytic philosopher. I'm sure yeah. there's other groups of philosophers that, yeah. that hate it, yeah. but, okay. <laughs> but it does kind of, it, I don't know if it like requires you to believe the correspondence theory to, to accept this distinction, but it, you know, there's something like that in the background. Okay. Probably. Okay. Cool, so, cool. But that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so, so those are cognitive mental states. Mm -hmm. Then there's conative mental states. Conative, so co okay. Conative, okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that right. I think I, I don't know. Yeah. I was saying conative, <laughs> so I have no idea. Oh, yeah. conative. Oh, maybe, yeah. Conative, conative. I, I'm going to defer to you. Yeah. You're I gonna... don't know. Uh, <laughs> conative, conative. I don't know. Yeah. So I'll just say conative for now. Okay. Um, conative mental states have the opposite direction of fit. So conative mental states would be like, uh, sorry, uh, desires. Uh, beliefs about the good. So like, I believe like it would be good if it rained tomorrow or I desire for it to rain tomorrow. And these have a direction of fit where ideally <laughs> the, the world conforms to your mind. Mm. So when you desire for it to rain tomorrow, you're saying, I want the world to, to fit with this, this thing I have in my head, yeah. this, this way that I'm hoping that or desiring for the world to be. Um, and so what's interesting is, um, you know, for beliefs and confidence levels, those are often things that to be rational, you need a good amount of evidence for, you mm -hmm. need to think the world is that way. But it's interesting that you can actually desire 
it to rain tomorrow or desire uh, you know, God to exist or something, yeah. uh, even if you don't have a ton of evidence for that. So I could look at the forecast and say, there's a 90% chance of rain tomorrow. Uh, but you know, I wish it, I wish it wasn't going to rain tomorrow. Cause I have a picnic planned. Yeah. Uh, or I could say I have a lot of evidence. Like the problem of evil is really tough and God kind of seems heading to me, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I still hope that God exists and I still desire for God to exist. And I still think God existing would be a good thing, you know? So um, so I guess these two, these are two different kinds of attitudes, but arguably, um, faith has a combination of both of these attitudes. Mm -hmm. So if I have faith that something is true, um, arguably I at least think there's some amount of evidence that that thing is true. Yeah. And I have some kind of desire or what philosophers might call a pro attitude. I think it would be good yeah. if that thing were true. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I could just, I think one of the examples I gave in the paper is like, if I have faith, you're going to win your basketball game. Presumably I at least think there's a decent chance you'll win your basketball game, or it's like not impossible. You'll win your basketball game. And also, um, I want you to win. I think it would be a good thing if you won. And if I'm missing one of those two, if I think there's no chance you're going to win, or I think it would be a terrible thing if you won, then I don't have faith. Yeah. Um, so, well, so, um, I I think it's it's pretty uh, clear that like a, a a cognitive state, you can judge that on uh, on credence or you know uh, this is irrational. If if I think that you know I can fly by flapping my my arms, can do do people talk about uh, conative beliefs as being rational or irrational? Can you have an irrational conative belief that you wish that you could flap your wings or your arms and and fly? Yeah. So the Often the the parallel that's made is cognitive mental states aim at the truth mm -hmm. and cognitive mental states aim at the good. Oh, okay. um, and okay. so, yeah, so it's like if I have a lot of evidence that something would be really bad for me, probably shouldn't desire it. But, you know, one example I've seen in the literature is like you could desire to get back with your really abusive ex, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and that's an irrational desire. It's something you shouldn't desire because it, it wouldn't be good for you. And you probably have a lot of evidence. It wouldn't be good for you. Yeah. Um, but you could nonetheless desire it because you're like weak willed or something. And maybe yeah. a, a lot of cases of weakness of will might fall into this. Like okay. I desire the chocolate cake, even yeah. though I'm trying not to eat it or whatever, you know? Um, and so, so yeah, I do think desires could be irrational um, okay. in the same way beliefs could be. I, I, uh, I really like the, the cognitive aspect as well, because uh, a lot of people, they pit like anything cognitive against faith. The faith is irrational. Faith is by definition, a leap, you know, against wow. your reason. And even the way Pascal uh, put it in that language, it sounded a little bit like that, but, you know, reading in context, if you can, because the, the pensées are all over the place. Right. But I don't think that's totally what he was getting at. I think he was getting at more, more what you were getting at. Um, but I really like that. So if you have a faith that is deficient in the cognitive, uh, has deficient cognitive states or evidence or justification or warrant or whatever, then, well, what do we call that faith? Can we just call that blind faith or deficient faith? Is that a different category of thing? Or irrational faith? Irrational I think faith. you could you could think about it. But yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Like, I like to give this example. It's like, let's say I'm married. So I have this marriage commitment. I am married. Um, and like, I get a little bit of evidence that my husband wasn't faithful just a little bit. Like maybe someone that I don't really trust says something or something, you know, it's like, that would be a case where I think given all the positive evidence I have that he is a good partner and he is faithful to me. Um, even if my credence goes down a tiny bit, I can, can still continue in my commitment. I can continue to believe and have faith. He's a good partner, all of that. But, but the, the view you're talking about <laughs> um, would say if someone gave me a video of him cheating on me, mm -hmm. um, you know, I should just continue to have faith. And that faith would just be so strong and demonstrate like such, such a great, a great faith in my husband, yeah. because I'm continuing to have faith, even in light of this ridiculous, like essentially proof that my husband wasn't faithful to me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's like, it's like, no, like, of course not. Like, yeah. and yes, my faith should be rational, uh, or, sh or should continue and can be rational, I think, uh, in light of some evidence against it. But it's not like the more evidence I have against something, 
the better it is to continue to have yeah. faith in that. That's just not true at all. Yeah. Um, so I, I really want to dispel that way of thinking. And, you know, I don't want to straw man fideism, but insofar as that would be a fideist view, I wouldn't. I would want to distance myself from that. Yeah, so, definitely. That's yeah. a great point. I, I really, I really like that. There's a, there's a weird like Kantian slip that comes in where it's like you, you know, uh, it's like deontology and beliefs. It's like, yeah, if I don't know if it's in Christian fundamentalism, sorry for the fundies who are listening, but yeah, it's like the stronger evidence against, it just shows that I'm a man of God that I can hold firm. And it's like, well, but you don't, you didn't do the hard work of thinking through it. You're just, you know, just, I don't care. I'm going to be stalwart. Yeah. And, and it, I think it, it's not, it, it, it makes people put their head in the sand and just mm -hmm. stop looking at arguments. Yeah. And I think instead, what they should do is actually look at the evidence. And I actually think there's really interesting evidence for God's existence. And they yeah. might just ignore that or miss that or um, not realize that this argument they're really struggling with, Christian philosophers have actually dealt with that in all these right. ways. Right. And so if they think like the less evidence, the better the faith, the, they might even miss out on a lot of this really great evidence. And I'd like to, to think about the example of, of Thomas. Like when Thomas was doubting and Thomas said, like, I just don't know if I can believe in the resurrection. Like, what did Jesus do? He wasn't like, oh, the less evidence, the you know, like just like the more improbable, the better. Like Jesus met Thomas where he was at and said, mm -hmm. like, here is some evidence. Like, look at the evidence, like touch my side, like literally tangible empirical evidence mm -hmm. that Jesus rose from the dead, you mm -hmm. know? And so um, I think there's, this isn't to say that like, it's not good to continue having faith in light of some counter evidence. That's right. not what I'm saying. I think that can be good, but I think it's a total misnomer to think the less evidence, the better the faith. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. What a good, what a good point. When you first said Thomas, I was thinking Aquinas. I thought you're going to go into the, the five ways and stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny how their mind goes. All, there. The, all the Thomases. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, so Liz, this brings us, uh, I, I wanted to cover a couple of objections, which, uh, when I first thought about the uh, the wager, so I, I am in, in more of a presuppositional uh, um, uh, run in those kind of circles, and man, it's just different on the popular level than it is from like James Anderson or someone in, in philosophy. But there there's certain like uh, canards and certain objections that pop up, and uh, one is the the many gods objection, and it turns out that's actually a an objection in the literature. And so, yeah. you know, everyone thinks, well, well, which God? And you hear it from atheists. And so then some Christian apologists who don't like the wager will, will use that. And it's even worse as it goes down. It's the telephone game. Uh, but it was really interesting to, to find that this was a real objection. And, uh, but then I, I think you also labeled it the Homer Simpson objection. Is that the same mm -hmm. objection or is there a, a nuance there? There's a slight difference. Okay. Um, although, Arguably, the Homer Simpson objection like builds on the many gods objection, okay. so they're very related for okay. sure. Um, so, do you want me to? Yeah, can you explain the yeah. uh, both of them for us, please? For sure. So, like, you know, you hear Pascal's wager. You're like, you should believe in God because, like, you can get these these gain. You know, you have a lot to gain and a little to lose, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when you think about it, it's like, well, a lot of religions don't work that way. It's not just like the choice between believing in God or not believing in God. Um, in a lot of cases, a religion would say, you need to practice or commit to our specific religion. Mm -hmm. And if you practice or commit to Christianity, and Islam turns out to be true on at least a lot of versions of Islam, that's not going to cut it. You're not mm -hmm. going to go to heaven just because you believed in God. Um, mm -hmm. And you're not you're going to miss out on a lot of the benefits of practicing the true religion um, if Islam is true. And yeah. so the question that uh, I think arises is, well, you've just talked about believing in God, but it's way more complicated than that. Which religion should we pick? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, I think it's a good, it's a good objection in the sense that it's not something that we can just dismiss or say is irrelevant. I think it's right. relevant. Um, and the way that I respond to this is actually just by incorporating the various religions into Pascal's wager. Yeah. And so I say, actually, when you're wagering, um, you shouldn't just make it about, should I believe in God or not believe in God? Although I do think that's a legitimate question to think about, but mm -hmm. I think ultimately it's going to have to be more complex than that. Um, I think you're going to have to think about the various religions and then ultimately the probability that each of those are true. And so the way that I put it, well, I think first of all, um, the religions that are ultimately going to matter for Pascal's wager are those that have an infinite afterlife. So infinite mm -hmm. heaven, infinite hell. So I've, heard, I've been told like some versions of Buddhism, for example, 
um, you're only like reincarnated or in the afterlife for a finite amount of time. So okay. those aren't going to be privileged on Pascal's wager. So focusing on the religions that have an infinite afterlife, um, what you're going to want to do is pick the religion that you think is most likely to be true. Okay. And um, you can either do this by studying the various religions and, you know, weighing the evidence against them but actually according to decision theory you could even just start off with the religion you currently think is most likely to be true but mm. then kind of do some research and do some evidence uh, evidence gathering um as you go so yeah. the way i will put it is it's good to have an informed opinion you know you don't want to just yeah. pick a religion at random but i also think you don't have to spend like 25 years of your life doing research either decision theory doesn't doesn't tell you that decision theory just says given kind of your current opinions especially if those are informed opinions uh you can kind of go off the one you, you currently think is most likely to be true so yeah. um so so one upshot of this is actually my version of pascal's wager even though i am a christian and i think christianity is most likely to be true mm -hmm. uh my version of pascal's wager doesn't tell you you have to wager on christianity um you could get that if you combined my argument with arguments that raise the probability of Christianity. Yeah. So like an argument for the resurrection or something, but it's not inherent to the Pascalian wagery part of, of yeah. my argument. Yeah. So that's the mini gods objection. Do you want me to talk about the Homer Simpson thing? Or yeah. Do you want well, to say something uh, first? So, so yeah. yeah, real quick that, um, that's, it's a good point and it's helpful because for so often we think an argument has to do way more than it's supposed to. Yeah. And so this has to, Establish the entire Christian worldview, and all my preceptor friends are, are freaking out right now. But <laughs> it's 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 not meant for all of that, or this version is not meant for all of that, right? And so there's yeah. there's different, uh, especially I mean, you know, with with all the prior probabilities, and and that that brings in the different arguments for God's existence that you have, and so there's a lot going on in this, and with decision theory and, and game theory and all that kind of stuff uh, at play. So I, I think that's that's such a good point to. To say, look, this, it doesn't have to do everything, and it's not going to, it's not going to answer divine simplicity for you either. Like, it's <laughs> okay to think about different things at different times. Yeah, exactly. And so, the main big upshot of my version of the wager is that it's going to be irrational for you to be an atheist or an agnostic, mm. unless you think it's more likely that atheists and agnostics go to heaven than than theists, which most people probably won't think that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so that is controversial. That's not. I'm not just saying do whatever's most likely. That's not the claim. Um, but I, I totally agree. I'm not trying to like give, then give 10 arguments for Christianity and do all this, you know, theology and talk about different religions. Like, you yeah. know, it's like, that's great. That's super interesting, but um, that's not part of the Pascal's wager that, that I endorse. So yeah. yeah. Uh, be before the, the Homer Simpson. Uh, so you, you talked about, um, you talked about religions with uh, infinity at play. Does, mm -hmm. So if you're if you're like a Christian annihilationist and you think that mm -hmm. those who are not Christians will be uh, annihilated some at some time, uh, does that still count? Uh, I mean, you still have the positive infinity. You just don't have like the, the negative of, of eternal torment. Uh, does that still count in there or, or we do? Should we discount them because they? they have <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's. Well, I think one thing to say, first of all, is most Christian annihilationists wouldn't say that the probability there's a hell is like zero. You know, they would okay. say there's at least some chance. So as long okay. as they like there's at least some chance, I think uh, that's going to make it uh, like have the same structure. Okay. But yeah, I do think if you were like 100 percent sure annihilationism is true, um, that is going to play that's going to play off differently. I'm trying to think. Because if you still think there's like an infinitely good heaven, that right. would still be a, a big benefit. Mm -hmm. But um, you're just going to have to kind of do the decision theory. But I do think uh, you would have to at least be a lot more probable than it would otherwise. Because okay. in the other religions, there's this huge risk that um, if you, you know, you could go to hell. Whereas if Christianity is true, you're only annihilated. I mean, mm -hmm. I also think, too, if you're a Christian annihilationist, you would probably think that if Islam's true, annihilationism is true also. Or, you know, what I mean, maybe. I don't yeah. know. I mean, maybe it would depend on what the you think the holy books teach. But if you mm -hmm. think like God would never send people to hell, a good God wouldn't send people to hell, then I think you could probably get the same argument going on Islam than on Christianity. Okay. Maybe. So yeah. yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Sorry for the random. Yeah. Just, yeah <laughs> no, just it's it's a great question. It's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so we can we can finally do Homer Simpson here. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, okay. So Homer Simpson objection. This is no one actually called it this except for me and Andy. Cause we think we're funny. Um, That's good. <laughs> but, it is funny. It's good. I hope but, it, it catches on. <laughs> but the Homer Simpson objection is based on this quote from, uh, from Homer Simpson, where he says, uh, what if, so what if he's like, what if we're practicing the wrong religion, then every time we go to church, we're just making God matter and matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it's like, uh, it's like what I was, arguing earlier was like, look, we have a good reason not to be an atheist or an agnostic. So go with the religion you think is most likely to be true. Um, and, and I say that, but that does need to be qualified in a couple ways. Yeah. And one way it needs to be qualified is here's a way you could maybe get around that. If you thought maybe God is this really, really, really jealous God. And if Christianity is true, but you practice Islam, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. um, God would be really, really pissed off if you if you got the wrong religion. Right. But and I'm not endorsing this, but you might say if you're an atheist or an agnostic, you're like neutral. You're not really practicing any religion. Mm -hmm. And so like maybe a, an analogy would be like you split up with your partner and you don't date anyone else versus you like go marry someone else or something. Yeah, right. I think, like, if you don't date anyone else, your partner won't be as angry at you. But if you like go start dating other people, maybe they would be. Yeah. Um, so think about practicing a different religion as like, you know, dating someone else. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so then the thought is, look, I'm just going to stay neutral and be an atheist or an agnostic rather than risking making God really mad by practicing the wrong religion. Mm -hmm. So that is a way you can get around my claim that you should practice the religion you think is most likely to be true. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and part of our response to this in, in the paper, mm -hmm. we, we actually partially just bite the bullet. And we say, mm -hmm. if you're really convinced that like, that's the right way to think about God's desires and that's the right theology, then our main goal in this paper is to just make you think about potential after like afterlife considerations in your decision-making. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're really thinking about like, how can I, you know, balance this risk reward trade off given these afterlife possibilities Our like most fundamental or most central goal in the paper is to make people think about that when they're making these decisions day to day. Yeah. Um, so in, in, in one sense, we're like, OK, maybe maybe those people should should just be atheists or agnostics. Right. Yeah. Um, but then kind of our second response is like, look is that really the best way to think about what God would want? And it is this like cheating on your spouse or partner analogy, really an apt analogy. And we kind of think, no, um, I mean, there's a lot of interesting issues here. This is related to the debate about whether Christians and Muslims worship the same, same God, for example, yeah. so that's super controversial. Um, but I do think one thing we point on the paper is a lot of people or a lot of religions prescribe similar actions. So they mm -hmm. want you to, give to the poor and, uh, you know, attend church services or, you know, some kind of religious services. They want yeah. you to pray. They want you to, to tithe to the church. They want you to do, do these various things. And so we give this, this analogy in the paper, which is like, um, let's say like a father has two sons, um, once, and he invites them both to his birthday party. One son comes, but has some false beliefs about the father. So brings him a present he doesn't like very much. Mm -hmm. Um, the other son, says you don't even exist ignores his invitation and never even talks to him you know right. it's like it's like and, and you know we could debate about is the spouse analogy better or is that analogy better but i think at least what this brings out is it's not at all clear that the spouse analogy is is the right way to think about it yeah so no i think that's helpful yeah you're just mot motivating a, a, a an intuition that seems just uh even on par with with that and, and maybe some will argue back and forth but yeah, you can you can motivate an analogy just uh, that's contrary, but but at equal level there. That's really that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah, and it's just not obvious to me that God is is jealous in the sense that's required to get this objection off the ground. You know, and and I think another thing to point out is even within Christianity, we have all these different debates about you know is is the Calvinist God or is God more like the Armenian God yeah. or you know whatever, and it's like almost all of us have some false beliefs about God, you know, no sure. one has all the perfect beliefs. And so it's hard to say like, there would be some cutoff where God would just start to get like super, 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 super jealous. I mean, I think there's a legitimate distinction between Christianity and other religions. That's not what right. I'm saying, right. but we all have some false beliefs and you might think that seeking God and trying to find God, even if you're in the wrong religion uh, would be as good, if not better than just 
ignoring God, not praying, saying God doesn't exist, or I don't know yeah. if God exists, and living your life however you want. Yeah. So that's that's like a, a really nice. You're you're like really nice, uh, and I really appreciate that. So I'm like more like pessimistic and like, and and you know maybe it's my Calvinism coming out, but it's like I would say what well, all all things on the other side of that are equally uh, making make him equally jealous. Atheism mm-hmm. and any false uh, religion would would be equally, and so but that's my prior, and so now we have to de- debate that, and and I can motivate, or I can I wouldn't be as good, but I could try to make a, an argument for an intuition that way as well. And and that is is not a problem for that that, that would not get the Homer Simpson objection off the ground because right, what the Homer exactly. Simpson objection requires is that God prefers atheism right. and agnosticism yeah. to practicing the wrong religion and so at least in that case like you're an atheist you're screwed you practice the wrong religion you're screwed but at least take the chance at at finding the true religion right, and, and right, look right. at the evidence and yeah. you know commit to the religion you think is most likely to be true so mm-hmm. so all of that is consistent the the thing I want to push push back on is saying God's going to kind of not treat atheists so bad or be kind of, kind of happy yeah. that you're an atheist rather yeah. than practicing the wrong religion. And yeah. that's where I, I don't think that that yeah. position will fly. So good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then the next one, which uh, it, I'll, and I'll need you to explain it a little bit more to me too, but the mixed strategy objection, which seems like it's uh, just for me skimming over it, it's like a problem uh, with mixing infinities into your decision theory. It, it, People have argued that it like balloons up things and messes with the, the probabilities and stuff. Is is that right? Can you explain it for us? Yeah, for sure. So, okay. And this is actually related to many God stuff too, but mm-hmm. um, I was giving more of like an intuitive gloss on it. And then there's a yeah. more like technical way of doing the many gods thing. So it's related, but I'll, I'll explain it this way. So when you're trying to make a decision about what to do mm-hmm. using decision theory, you actually, you take the probability um, that some that the world is a certain way and then you multiply it by um, like a utility so like how good it would be if the world was a certain way this is actually related to the cognitive and cog- cognitive thing nice. um so so yeah so this is related to what you were talking about before mm-hmm. but you're doing this probability multiplicate you're multiplying probabilities and utilities so mm-hmm. that that's kind of an important piece of background information okay. so kind of the really basic you know, the first version of Pascal's wager that I gave when you first asked me, what is Pascal's wager? Mm-hmm. Um, what you're sort of doing there is you're saying, well, as long as there's some chance that God exists, even if the probability is like 0.00001%, if I multiply that by this infinite good, then it's going to be better to believe in God. Believing God would be infinitely good. Not believing in God, either there would be zero or even like negative infinity. Yeah. So, so the decision theory based version of pascal's wager there you're doing this multiplication thing and then in, like maybe intuitively or i would even say maybe naively you're relying on this principle where any positive probability times infinity is just going to be infinity yeah okay so that's sort of where this objection comes in so what this objection says is well look if it's any positive probability and it's always just going to be inf- infinite then, you know, I could believe in God and then um, I would have a, like a high chance at going to heaven. Um, like I believe in God. Maybe I think there's still a low chance that God exists, but mm-hmm. I multiply that by infinity. It's infinite. But instead, <laughs> um, and this gets weird. It's, it's part of it just has to do with the way that decision theory is structured. So it's hard to make it intuitive. But that thought is, look, what if I flip a coin? If the coin lands heads, I'll believe in God or commit to God. But if it lands tails, I'll just go about my life as normal. Let's say Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Um, Well, if I think about that possibility, instead of there being, you know, 100% probability that I believe in God, there's now a 50% probability that I'll believe in God, right? Yeah, yeah. But I just take that probability, then multiply that by infinity, and it's still infinite. So choice one, believe in God directly. Choice two, flip a coin. If the coin lands heads, then I believe in God. And then if all you're doing is multiplying these by infinity and you think any positive probability times infinity is the same, at the end of your decision theory calculation, which we haven't really gone in how to calculate that. So right. if you're not following all of this and you're watching, it's, it's okay because it, this is just how you calculate stuff with decision theory. Yeah. But at the end of the decision theory calculation, both of those are going to be the same. They're both just going to be infinity. And is it, is it because you anything <laughs> is is anything t- multiplied by an infinity an infinity itself? Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. No. So this is like this is what I think is the naive thing that is being assumed in the background that we shouldn't assume. Yeah. Um. But I I think 
you know, if you don't really sit, if you don't really sit down and think about it, that might seem right. That might seem like, yeah, maybe, maybe that's true. Yeah. But here's why I, I think that can't be right. Okay. <laughs> and I've given this example a lot, but yeah. I say like, look, let's say you have two options. Like you're, there's two doors, uh, in both doors, there's some chance that you'll get an infinite good. If you pick it door number one, maybe there you spin a roulette, roulette wheel and there's a 90% chance you'll get this infinite good. Door number two, you spin a wheel and there's only a 10% chance you get this infinite good. But if we're relying on this naive idea that you just multiply the probability times how good it would be, and then that's you know your expected value, uh, it seems like 0.9 times infinity, 0.1 times infinity, they're both infinite. So I should be indifferent, right? I should I should <laughs> uh, flip a coin to pick which door to pick. Right, or if right. you give me if you give me ten bucks and say pick pick the door with the ten percent chance, I should do that because yeah. they're both the same, and then I yeah. get this additional ten dollars, right? Right. And to me, it's just like this is this is totally separate from Pascal's wager. This uh -huh. isn't. I'm not just saying this because I want Pascal's wager to work. Right. It's right. like it's like come on, like of course I don't care if you're a theist or an atheist or whatever. You clearly shouldn't. You know, you should clearly take the 90% chance, right, assuming right. you want this infinite good, right? Yeah. So the problem, I think, with the mixed strategies objection is it's assuming that any infinite, any positive probability times infinity is infinite. Yeah. Um, in other words, it, it's what's called infinity has this absorption property. So infinity mm. is absorbing any yeah. of the, all of these probabilities, and it's just the same. And so the answer to this is you just can't treat all infinities the same. And you have to look at the probabilities of these various things. So this is so this is why it's related to the, to the many gods objection, because that's why we say go for the religion you think is most likely to be true. It's like taking the 0.9 door rather than the yeah. 0.1 door. And this is also why you should just believe in God directly. That gives you a much higher chance at getting the infinite good rather than uh, flipping a coin. And if that coin lands heads, then believing in God, because that only gives you the 0.5 chance at the infinite good. Yeah. So so it actually, this idea that probability matters in decision-making, even infinite decision-making, yeah. um, that can actually solve both of these objections. Yeah. Wow, that's really helpful. Yeah, that's that's so good. Yes, okay. And yeah. I... I uh, Infinities are so weird, and I, I don't know very much about math. Like, I'm, I'm trying to work on that. Uh, I had to study for the GRE, and I had to learn math again. I had to learn what an integer was, which was really sad for me. But I, I did. I learned it. I remember uh, doing that. Yeah. Super, super sad. But, GRE. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. But I think, I think like, people in mathematics know this, that, like, there's some weird ones. And maybe I shouldn't even bring this up and make us both look silly if we don't know. But there's, like, more positive integers in, in infinity then do you know what i'm talking about i forgot yes. what it is offhand. It's, it's called it's called Cantor's diagonalization theorem yes you look so, so smart now this is great can you say it one more time <laughs> well, for us? yeah yeah yeah. so Cantor's diagonalization theorem let's go and what Cantor proved i think it's super cool mm -hmm. is that there's more okay so there's like the counting numbers one two three four five six there's an infinite number of those yes um then there's irrational numbers which are decimals that can't be put into fraction form like pi. Mm -hmm. Cantor proved that there's more irrational numbers, even though there's an infinite number of both, there's more irrational numbers than counting numbers. He proves this, I'm not going to go into it, but he proves mm -hmm. this by showing you can't put them into what's called a one-to-one -one correspondence. Mm -hmm. So if I have the same number of apples as oranges, if I have five of each, I can put them into a one-to-one -one correspondence, and then I know there's the same number. Mm -hmm. And there's actually more irrational numbers than there are uh, counting numbers. They cannot be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence. And this opens, I mean, this just opens the door for like, how many sizes of infinities are there? Yeah. And is there, an, is there a biggest size of infinity? And yeah. I mean, some people just think like, this can't even be right. Like there can't be, you know? And so it's like, there's, there's all these really interesting debates, but the proof is really compelling. If you go on YouTube and you just type in Cantor's diagonalization theorem, there's actually some pretty good, not too long videos that kind of explain how it works. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's pretty compelling. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, philosophers like to <laughs> question everything. So some of them are like, no, that can't be right. But yeah. I think most people now think there are different sizes of infinities. And yeah. it's interesting to think about ways you can use this research that's being done on the different sizes of infinities to try to compare infinities in Pascal's wager. Right. And there's also a theorem, um, I forget, it's like L. Hopital's theorem or something. I don't know, I'm probably saying that wrong. But what you do is you actually take two infinities and then I think what you do is you take the derivative of each of them and then you can also use that to compare them as well. Oh. So it's, um, 
it's like calculus stuff that honestly, yeah. some of it is above my pay grade. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in our paper, we also have a paper that's called Salvaging Pascal's Wager. Mm -hmm. And in that paper, we actually just show a way you can use um, limits and ratios to, to do it. And you don't have to multiply by infinities at all. So okay. it's kind of a, in my opinion, you know, it's, a, it's, it's technical, but it's not as bad as some of this like really intense stuff. Yeah. But yeah, um, I guess the point is there's a lot of different ways you can model this, but I do think mathematicians are definitely on board with the idea that all infinities aren't the same. So. Yeah, I love that. All infinities <laughs> yeah. aren't created equal, which is, it seems yeah. counterintuitive, but yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just, just this reminded me why philosophy of religion is so cool. And sometimes I get, because I study, uh, I have, I'm working on theology degrees. I'm like, I just want to do just pure philosophy to show that I have some philosophical chops and I don't want to do philosophy of religion because I don't want to be pigeon held and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But philosophy of religion is so cool because there is, there are things at stake and kind of like the, this meta Pascal's wager of why philosophy of religion is up here and philosophy, because <laughs> it, it, it brings out things like this where it's like, well, we need to know our infinities bigger than other ones. Well, why does that matter? Because it matters for Pascal's wager. And if Pascal's wager is right, then I need to believe in God or not believe in God. And it's, yeah. there's a lot at stake. I love that. I love that too. I think, so Paul Draper is actually, I don't know if he's an atheist or an agnostic, but mm. he um, is at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And he's actually working on an argument that's a version of Pascal's wager that is just that, like, we should all do philosophy of religion is like the, the conclusion or whatever. Um, so he, I think he I like doesn't think it's like, gives you a reason to believe in God, but he does think there's really high stakes and it, and it gives us all a reason to care. It gives yeah. us all a reason to look at the arguments at the very least um, and really consider them and and really be interested in, in philosophy of religion. So, so yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And yeah. I've had the same thing where I'm like, oh, I want to do like, you know, some non-philosophy religion stuff too, I guess. But yeah. I, I, I keep coming back to philosophy of religion and um, I mean, both because I find it interesting, but yeah, also because I do think, I do think the stakes are pretty high. So. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. It's so cool. It's like, you know, there's always uh, the theology is the, the queen of the sciences and stuff like that. But philosophy of religion is the queen of philosophy. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's always been here. All, all the good arguments, not all of them, right? But there's a lot. Even the disagreement literature started because Feldman was teaching undergrads about uh, religion and asking if they could be reasonable, even though they disagree. So, yeah. One thing, I, I one thing I think is really interesting, too, is like, you know, there's all these questions in philosophy, like, do composite objects exist mm -hmm. or is free will compatible with determinism or, you know, can we know that we're not brains in about, you know, all these questions. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but when you go to someone on the street, they often, they probably haven't really thought about or just don't really care <laughs> maybe yeah. even about a lot of these questions. But when you look at the questions in philosophy of religion, especially like does God exist or what is God like? Mm -hmm. Almost everyone has thought about that. And almost yeah. everyone has an opinion about that. And a lot of people do care about that a mm -hmm. lot. Um, of course, there'll be apathetic people and whatever, but even those people have still thought about it and still care. Yeah. And this is one reason I think in teaching, people really get interested in philosophy of religion. Students really like it. Students mm -hmm. will, like I taught skepticism. So like, can we know we're not brains in about whatever. And like half the students are like, this is so stupid. Why are we talking yeah. about this? Yeah. But like students love philosophy of religion is, is at least from my experience. And, and I do think, I think it, it is really, really, really important. Um, yeah. And I think it's it's interesting how that's reflected in the philosophical questions that people have considered versus haven't. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, uh, you're like reinvigorating my love for philosophy religion here. But even so I taught, I, I helped co-teach -te a uh, uh, philosophy course here at TEDS in the undergrad and helping to motivate the skeptical questions that they didn't really want to consider brain and that kind of stuff. You just pit that against their faith. And you say, well, mm. what if we are? What if we are in a computer simulation, and what you think is God is actually a simulator? How how do you argue? You turn a witness to someone on the street; they come up and say this to you. What do you say? And then it starts to motivate, and you, and these classical questions come up because you brought God into the mix, and and so even that helps motivate some philosophical questions, which is really fun. Yeah, and I think it's cool too. Like I, a lot of the students I teach aren't religious. Some are, but a lot are, are like, actually, I have a lot of students that are Muslim, which is kind of cool. Hmm. Um, but even among that crowd, I think they get really interested in philosophy of religion. Like 
my I did a unit on faith last last semester in epistemology and like the students were just really liked it. So yeah. it's cool how I think it, it works for everyone, not just religious people, like yeah. non-religious people find this super interesting too. And they were actually like, thank you so much for including this. A lot of our professors don't include it because right. it's too it's too divisive or, you know, whatever. And of course you have to be respectful and realize, yeah. especially at a non-Christian school, people are gonna disagree about this, but but students get really motivated and, and get really into it, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, there, there's there's one more objection that's uh, so we, we talked about in the philosophical literature and the debates. There's one that's going to come up that, uh, yeah, the reform folks and or not just biblical folks in general. Uh, I, I first heard this objection I think from John Piper. He was mm -hmm. speaking somewhere and he's uh, he he brings he talks about Pascal's wager and talks about First Corinthians 15. And uh, can I just, can I just read the passage for us? So it's 15 starting at 12 and it, uh, Piper brought this up and said, you know, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope uh, in this life, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, there we go. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of we are of all people most to be pitied. And so some people will use this against Pascal's wager and say, no, even if you if you wager on this, uh, what, what Paul is saying is that if you wager on this and you're wrong, then we should actually be most pitied among all among all people. What do you think? Is this is this accurate against uh, the wager? What do you think? Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Um, nice. um, yeah, no, I think this is super interesting. And we were actually talking about this a little bit before. And yeah. part of my answer is I need to think more about this because um, one other time has this been brought up to me, but I I don't have a fully thought out answer. So yeah. part of my answer is I don't know. And mm -hmm. let's think about it together, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I do think, I guess one thing to maybe say is like a little background on what I'm wondering is maybe if like the decision theory framework is just capturing a different kind of thing than what pa yeah. uh, Paul is talking about here. Yeah. So decision theory is a lot about kind of how to be rational, sort of given your current perspective. Yeah. Um, so given your beliefs and given your desires, how how can you be rational? How how should you act? What should you believe? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think it's interesting to think about how that perspective might interact with Paul's statements here, Paul seems to be taking a much more like objective stance. So like, if this is false, uh, you kind of wasted your life. You're kind of yeah. screwed. You're the most to be pitied, right? Yeah, right. Um, and I'm wondering if we could sort of accept both in some sense. So mm -hmm. um, in an objective sense, like Paul is right. And I think the the wager kind of even admits this that i mean this will depend on some things we were talking about at the beginning of the interview right. but like if god doesn't exist how do we sort of weigh those values or like what values do we put there and maybe if we commit to god and god doesn't exist that that would be really bad and we like totally wasted our lives and that yeah. sucks you know yeah. Yeah. um but i guess what <laughs> what the pascalian person is thinking is like but we don't know that God doesn't exist. And in fact, we might think it's actually really likely that God does exist. Um, you know, where that probability might lie is going to depend on the person, yeah. but at least like from your current viewpoint, it is still rational to continue in that commitment. So I don't know. I don't know if that's the best way to square it to say like Pascal is more about this subjective perspective, whereas Paul's more taking this objective perspective. Yeah. But that's, I think, one thing to say. Um, I was going to say something else and then it just slipped out of my mind. Well, um, I think, I think yeah. that um, it sounds like, like planning us like de jure, de facto kind of distinction, right? Paul's talking about like the fact of the matter and yeah. Pascal's talking about whether it's reasonable or not, whether the, 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 yeah. And that's, that's what you just broke down. And I like that exactly. planning language because it took me so long to learn it, to understand what he's <laughs> yeah. saying. So I'm like, I got it now. I'm using it. Uh, yeah. And I think you're I probably it. right. I, I'm, I'm sure someone might say, well, okay, Paul's, Paul's, 
specific context here, he's speaking against those who who disbelieve in the resurrection or, or think it's mm. already happened or something. So that's, but I think at the end there, he is still saying, you know, if in Christ we have uh, hope only in this life, then we are most to be pitied. But if, now if that's true, like who's going to even be around to pity us? Like what, like we're not, we don't exist anymore, right? If that's not, if there's no resurrection from the dead, uh, that is like annihilation, annihilationism for everyone. Right, we're just blink out of existence, and so yeah, you can, you can pity them, but they're they don't care anymore. There, there's yeah. nothing to care anymore. It's gone. So right. I wonder. I don't want to like argue against Paul here. I'm not trying to do that, but I think I think you're you're, you're making a helpful distinction. That I, just trying to think through. Yeah. Yeah, and I totally think like we gotta we gotta look at passages like this in in the context, and mm -hmm. um, you know, I you know, if if I was you know. Uh, more prepared or, you know, it would have been, yeah, I guess it would have been good. Yeah. To, <laughs> no, no, no. But it would have been good to like, look at the context of first Corinthians and why is Paul saying this and who is his audience? And I actually yeah. believe that that is really important. And mm -hmm. um, I, I really like, I listen to the Bible project a lot. I don't know if you've ever listened to that. For sure. That's a really mm -hmm. awesome podcast that really helps put things in historical and literary context too. Yeah. So I do think you're right that like, if Paul is speaking to these specific people that don't believe in the resurrection, um, that, that might change you know, the way we view it or, or the message that Paul is sending, which is like, if you're a Christian, you should believe in the resurrection. And if you don't, like, that sucks, you know, like, yeah. that's that's a big deal. So I do think, too, just like yeah. looking at that context. But um, well, the other thing I was, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Well, well, so what's interesting here, uh, I just think about uh, Pascal and how people will go, no, in his context, there weren't atheists around. And I think it's, it's probably similar for Paul here, too. And he's talking in context of Jews uh, and, and pagans. And he's saying, which is interesting. It seems like he might be raising the Homer Simpson objection because he's saying, if there is no, then we've misspoken about God. He's not saying that there is no God, uh, but that we've misspoken. And, and that's why we're to be most pitied, maybe. And so we're, we're living our whole life uh, proclaiming false things about God. And, and it's in that theistic context where everyone's a, a Christian anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, to that's totally consistent with Pascal's wager because mm -hmm. the wager is totally open to the idea that again, if you believe in God and God doesn't exist, you're losing stuff. You're maybe, yeah. maybe even a significant loss, mm -hmm. but you know, the thought is there's still more to gain if God exists yeah. to commit your life to God. Yeah. So I do think that's consistent. And I also think too, I, I like, you know, I think there's other really interesting parts of scripture that support at least something like, Pascal's wager. So one mm. passage I talk about a lot, maybe too much, but I really like it is where the man um, is, he brings his daughter to Jesus to be healed. And he mm -hmm. says, I believe help my unbelief. Yeah. And I actually think, you know, he's kind of wagering on Jesus, right? He's like, look, you know, I I'm not sure I have some doubts. Um, but but I'm gonna I'm, I have enough confidence in Jesus that I'm gonna take a risk and, and yeah. bring my daughter to Jesus. Um, and I believe in help my unbelief. And so yeah. I think it's interesting. It's interesting to look at different parts of scripture and then, you know, try to try to fit it all yeah. together, try to try to figure out how it all works. But um, and like I said at the beginning, you know, I want to think more about this passage and I want to think more about what it means. But mm -hmm. I think it's also it can be balanced with other parts of scripture that I think do support this idea that you can continue in your commitment to God or even make a commitment to God, even in light of serious doubt, because of how good it would be if God existed and and you pursued this relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. That's that's like the um, that's the positive aspect. Is there a negative aspect where you say like be, because of I, I will continue to hold my belief in God even though I've been presented with evidence because of the contrary, because of what it would mean if there were no God, right? So there, you're we're talking about this this infinite good. Uh, I, I guess it wouldn't be a, a finite. I guess it wouldn't be an infinite bad or a negative infinity. But it's like, well, the, the opposite is then this whole thing's a big joke. We're wearing clothes, but we're really just ev highly evolved apes. We say we have a soul, but it's really a, an accident of history that our minds are so sharp because we we're trying to survive. And we accidentally became self-aware and self-conscious. And this whole thing's a joke. And I, I can't believe that. So I will continue even with uh, potential defeaters in my face. Yeah, you could say like, I mean, so look. You shouldn't always believe something just because you want it to be true. And mm -hmm. often that's irrational. Yeah. But in my opinion, 
if it's a situation where you have a good amount of evidence or something, if if it's a permissive case, yeah, yeah, um, then I actually think you can take you can take the position, at least in a lot of situations, that you want to be true. Um, and until you get, you know, you might get to the point where you just get so much evidence that it's overwhelming and you you can no longer continue in that belief. Yeah. But I think there are a lot of cases where the evidence could kind of go either way. So you can you can pick the one based on your desire, you know. Yeah. Um, there's something Pascalian about that too. Yeah, I yeah. like that. I I think there's there's like some weird rigorism that's like no. Uh, we talked about it. It's kind of Kantian maybe, where it's like I'm because I want it to be true. I won't believe in it. I've heard that a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm glad that you're giving us permission to this, to yeah. <laughs> this was here. actually I'm teaching critical thinking this semester, and mm -hmm. this was actually a question on their first test. It was like. Um, if I hope something's true, it can never be rational to believe it. Mm. Uh, and because we were just talking about, you know, rational belief and how we should follow our evidence and all this stuff. Yeah. And it's really funny. A lot of the students put, what well, would it be true? If if you hope it's true, you can't, it can't be rational to believe it. Right. But it's like, what? No, of course that's not true. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, depends on your evidence. And there's a lot of things that we want to be true or hope to be true and have really good evidence for. So, yeah, yeah it's you know, people can miss that because they're so worried about engaging in wishful thinking. Yes. Oh man, that's so good. <laughs> wow. Well, Liz, thanks. Thanks so much. This has been really helpful. I'd, I'd love to for you to come back on and talk more about this stuff. It's so interesting. And like I said earlier, this is not something that I'm naturally drawn to. I want to talk, I want to talk like, yeah, transcendental arguments, those kind of things and not probabilities. And so I'm stretching my, I'm trying to get stretched and, and you're so good at it. So I really uh, appreciate you coming on here. Um, where can people find more uh, from you if they want to yeah, hear more? Yeah, definitely. So um, my website is liz-jackson.com. Mm -hmm. um, so that has like all my papers. So mm -hmm. I guess two, t two tabs there to highlight. Uh, research has links to all my papers. Uh, you can download them all for free. I, I really try to put stuff out there and have it be open access. Part of one of my passions is getting people in, like that are interested in philosophy but aren't professional philosophers like like making philosophy accessible yes. to a lot of people yes. so i have all my papers up there um and then the other tab i want to highlight is the uh public philosophy tab so on that tab i have a bunch of interviews mm -hmm. um some podcasts that i've done um and i also have a youtube channel where i just have you know it's not it's nothing it's it's new it's nothing crazy but um a lot of my like lectures for class are up there and then i, I posted some some things that are related to my research on that as well um so you could check that out if you go to the public philosophy page i think there's a link to my youtube channel at the top of that but then there's also like a bunch of videos that are like interviews and things that i've done awesome. so yeah okay well i'll put i'll put all those links in the description too uh sorry to make you say all that and then i'll just drop no, it in here. But, that's uh, all so good. <laughs> if you guys are interested in that check the description for this uh and I, I just want to say, Liz, you you do such a good job of being like you're very good at what you do. But when you read your papers, it's not hard to do. It's not hard to read. It's it's really easy mm. to read. It draws you in. And then I, I, every now and then you get some nice gems like Homer Simpson stuff, which is really fun. And <laughs> I say that millennials are my favorite. I'm a millennial. I used to be uh, begrudging other millennials. Now I just love the whole generation because oh. I think when we we like, we're curious. We're curious people. We want to find out and we don't really like a lot of the, that's the way it is kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we say, well, no, I'm mm -hmm. going to figure out why it is like that. And I'm going to use some pop culture reference like Homer Simpson, like this and that, some <laughs> stuff I grew up with. Let's toss Rugrats in here maybe. And let's yeah. see what happens. Yeah. I, I love it. Yeah. I like throwing those in, in my lectures for my students too. Yeah. I think I, yeah, I threw in like a Kyrie Irving joke about mm -hmm. flat earth. Yeah. It's just, I, it just makes yeah. it more fun to read. So yeah. I try, I'm, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm I'm not the most hilarious person ever, but I try. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Anyway, yeah. Thanks for having me on. This was really fun, and yeah. I really you, you had some really great questions, and this was just a really great conversation. So awesome. thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, this uh, conversation will uh, continue, Lord willing, but that's gonna have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. <laughs>